Um, welcome. Thank you for all, um, for all coming uh, to this inaugur inaugural keynote for the Ancient World Lecture Series on the Gulf and the Ancient World, um, which we're proud to be presenting in collaboration with Zaid University. The Ancient World is a new area of study here at NYUAD, but we are building on a dynamic and rich and in, an, an intrinsically connected past here in the Gulf. Fifteen years ago, at the first international um, conference on the archaeology of the UAE, Beatrice de Cardi asked whether or not there was a future for the Emirates past. We see this lecture series as one of many efforts in the UAE and the wider Gulf which confirm the vibrancy of this past and the promise of the future. The potential for this future is especially clear here on Sadiat which is a growing international cultural hub thanks to projects such as the Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, the Zaid National Museum, and of course, NYU Abu Dhabi. These projects are witness to the extensive international links of the UAE and the Gulf more widely. Links that in fact stretch back for millennia. Writing the history of this region is of course a long and labor intensive process. The most recent chapter of this vital history is in fact now in the process of being rewritten. Excavations at Maleha in Sharjah have uncovered a tombstone inscription that refers to a powerful kingdom in the third century BCE. Moreover, for the first time, we now know details about a leader in this region, the King of Oman, Ahmad bin Jar bin Ali Kahin. I can think of no one better than Peter McGee to give this keynote lecture. Peter is a specialist of the prehistory of the UAE, whose work explores the formation of human societies and the role of technology in the Arabian Peninsula. He has been excavating here since 1992 um, and currently directs two projects at Tel Abraq and at Muwela. Peter is Chair and Professor in the Department of uh, Classical and Near Eastern Archaeology at Bryn Mawr and the Director of the Middle Eastern Studies Program there. He gained his PhD in 1996 at the University of Sydney. He's also worked in Pakistan, in Yemen um, and the Near East and his work has been funded by various prestigious entities including the Mellon Foundation, the National Geographic uh, and the National Science Foundation. He has a long and impressive list of publications, including his latest book from Cambridge, The Archaeology of Prehistoric Arabia, Adaptation and Social Formation from the Neolithic to the Iron Age. I think we're in for a treat tonight, so I'll turn over the, the podium to, to Peter. Thanks. Thank you for that um, very kind introduction, Fiona. It's a real pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you about the research I've been conducting in the United Arab Emirates since 1992. Um, I want to thank NYU Abu Dhabi for the invitation. Today I want to try to situate some of the research and the outcome of the research I've been doing within a broader understanding of the region, the Middle East, and as we call it, uh, the ancient Near East. Geographically, we're talking about a small part of this entire region. So we can see here roughly the area of the United Arab Emirates and the Sultanate of Oman. But archaeological research and historical research has, of course, focused on this huge area from Iran through Iraq, through the Levant and into Egypt and the Eastern Mediterranean for at least 200 years. Geographically, the United Arab Emirates as a very, very small part of this and has been a relative uh, newcomer to archaeological research in this region as a whole. It has, it would be fair to say, suffered from certain perspectives which have sought to see it both as an environmental and to some extent as a cultural margin within the broader picture of this region. There's no clearer illustration of this then by a, uh, through a quote by Dame Kathleen Kenyon, one of the considered great Near Eastern archaeologists whose book, The Archaeology of the Holy Land, is still used as a textbook um, through universities um, throughout the world. In this quote from the updated version of her book in the 1980s, she makes clear her perspective on the Arabian Desert, Arabia, and by definition or extension, the United Arab Emirates. <clears throat> 
you don't need to read the whole quote, and certainly um, I'm not going to either, since reading stuff which is on the screen seems a bit redundant. Um, however, I have underlined and emboldened the things which are important. Arabia, blank, empty, nomads, covet, erupt, hungry nomads, and importantly, age-long. And this age-long struggle, this idea that there is a timelessness to the Arabian desert, a timelessness to areas which lay outside the fertile river valleys of the region, is very pronounced, in fact, in, in scholarship. And as you can see from Dame Kath Kathleen Kenyon down there, you wouldn't argue with her um, in a hurry. Um, she was a formidable scholar, and she looks up, she glances up towards the quote to make sure that I've got it right, and I think I have. Um, these ideas, the timelessness, the relatively barren nature of the Arabian Desert, permeate uh, archaeological research and Near Eastern archaeological research um, considerably. What I'm going to do now is see or, or, or talk about the way in which these ideas contour research, but then also introduce step by step the archaeology of the United Arab Emirates and make the case that there is not only a dynamic, interesting prehistory to this region, but there is something also different. It's different not, as Kathleen Kenyon suggests, because of the difference between the settled and the nomads, or the Bedou and the Hadar. It's much more complicated than that. It's a society which is formed over thousands of years, is unique, it resists attempts to make it like other societies in the region, and it embraces its position, a position which sees it, as you can see here, facing the Indian Ocean and facing the rest of the Near East as well. This, this begins, this perception begins when we discuss the Neolithic Revolution. Now, the Neolithic Revolution happens around 11,000 years ago, around 9,000 BC. Now, I'm not going to go through every year since that to bring it to the modern period. I'm going to skip and move through several phases of occupation. But the Neolithic Revolution is perhaps the most studied aspect of the ancient Near East. It is when humans first began to settle in one place, build buildings, farm animals, um, uh, grow crops and farm animals um, based upon the domestication of plants and animals. In the pre-pottery Neolithic period of this region, particularly this sort of um, crescent-shaped area, which is sort of fertile, right? so the fertile crescent, this area has been heavily focused upon within the Neolithic Revolution and the margins of the fertile crescent as well. It is in this zone which people believe these major changes to human uh, existence occurred. They are marked by the domestication of wheat, barley, chickpeas and lentils and other crops and the appearance or the domestication of animals such as sheep, goat and cattle. These fundamentally transformed life in these regions. They, it, it resulted or it was um, coincident with the emergence of sedentary villages such as we see here, the village of Chatohuyuk, um, dated in the 6th millennium BC in Turkey or other villages such as this fabulous village of Jerf al Akmar on the Euphrates in Syria. And I could illustrate dozens of these villages, of course. And these are characterized by sedentary existence, people living in the one place all year round and growing crops and keeping animals. For most Near Eastern archaeology, this is considered to be a kickoff point, a starting point to the emergence of states about 5,000 years later. The Arabian Peninsula is different from this, and I'm going to explain why. First of all, however, I just wanted to point out that in this fertile crescent area where these big innovations occurred, we see the emergence and the slow transition by about 5500 BC of movement into areas outside of the fertile crescent. So the very northern parts of Iraq and then central Iraq and then eventually southern Iraq. These changes, this spread of farming, is possible because of the use of irrigation. We see, for example, on this line, that red line, that's map, this red line is the area above which dry farming, farming without irrigation is possible, and below which dry farming um, is not possible and irrigation is needed. And we start to see this occur throughout the region around 5500 BC. Arabia doesn't enter 
the epistemological frameworks of this research. This dominates Near Eastern research. And as Kathleen Kenyon suggested, the area outside of these changes is seen as sort of uninteresting from an archaeological perspective. And I think this is a fundamental mistake, and it fundamentally misunderstands the complexity of the region as a whole. What happens in Arabia during this period? In fact, if we think of the deserts of Arabia, um, that Arnold Sais, a great Assyriologist, described as the dreary deserts of Arabia. In fact, during this period, there's major changes in the climate that are occurring. So we can see from a sequence of paleoclimatic proxies from Oman, uh, from Dofar, beginning around 8,600 8, BC. And if you just look at those dots and see them move up from Huta Cave in Oman, 8,100 BC, Evidence for increased summer rainfall. And then to Awafi and Ras al Khaimah, we see around 7,000 BC, evidence for the increase in summer rainfall. In fact, what's happening in the Neolithic period in the Arabian Peninsula and in the United Arab Emirates is a pretty important climatic shift. It is the uh, monsoon, uh, the Indian Ocean monsoon, the summer monsoon, moves considerably to the north during these millennia, until it probably reaches somewhere around the central to northern parts of the modern-day Saudi, modern Saudi Arabia. This brings significant summer rainfall to the entire peninsula, especially the United Arab Emirates. Now, it's not a consistent single block of climate change, but it begins around 8,000 BC and ends around 4,000 BC, let's say. Approximately. There are periods where it comes and goes, but generally, in these millennia, there is much more rainfall than there is currently in the United Arab Emirates, which is, let's say, around 100 millimetres of rainfall per annum, about four inches. This fundamentally changes the way in which people are living in this region. Now, before we think about an Arabian Neolithic, we have to acknowledge and accept that there were people living here already, People had been living in the United Arab Emirates for thousands of years before the changes which I'm about to describe. In fact, the earliest evidence that we have for anatomically modern humans in this region comes from uh, a site called Jebel Faya in Sharjah, and that dates to around 125,000 years ago. It's one of the sites which speaks to the initial dispersal of anatomically modern humans um, across um, the region. People had been living there during the centuries and the millennia before these climate changes. People had been living and they were, if you like, late Paleolithic um, hunters, um, effectively. These people reacted to climate change, but they significantly reacted to the major changes which were occurring elsewhere in the region at the time. So as we can see most clearly from this recent study of rock art in uh, Saudi Arabia, from a site called Shuamus, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, within the rock art we see a transition from hunting scenes to herding scenes. And the archaeologists that have published this have looked at the way in which the rock art overlays each other to get an idea of the chronology or the time frame. This speaks to a fundamental transition in human existence within the Arabian Peninsula. People started herding animals. They had domesticated sheep, goat and cattle, which they got from elsewhere, from that sort of fertile crescent area. They had their own distinctive stone working traditions, which are very diverse and which come from, in, in part, from the outside, but are locally and they speak to very indigenous or autochthonous processes. They hunt as they always have hunted, but they don't adopt everything which is coming from the outside. For example, we have no evidence of agriculture during these centuries and millennia in the Arabian Peninsula. I've argued that this is an example of what can be called negative consumption. Now, I know that sounds like a tortured American anthropological phrase, um, and it is, in fact. <laughs> um, what it means is that during periods of interaction, people can adapt things, they can take domesticated sheep and goat, they can use them because it suits the environmental conditions which exist at that time. But other conditions, they choose not to adapt. They say, no, we're not using this, even though, I would argue, it was 
possible for people to have practiced small-scale agriculture during the Neolithic in parts of the Arabian Peninsula. They choose not to do that. They have agency in the way in which they interact with these more um, fertile um, regions of the ancient Near East. I'm just going to get myself some water. Just be a second. <laughs> um, that negative... Um, um, I've got a lapel on, so I could just keep talking. Um, that negative um, interaction, we, we might see, for example, in the evidence for interaction with Ubaid period Mesopotamia. Um, during this period, there are medium-sized villages emerging in Mesopotamia with, based on irrigation agriculture. And we see evidence for contact between the United Arab Emirates and these regions just, just off the coast of Abu Dhabi, and for example, um, the site of Dalma and other coastal sites such as Marawa, and here I acknowledge the work of Mark Beach and Peter Hellier, um, have revealed a really interesting coastal Neolithic occupation during this region, during this period. But what were these people like? They were nomadic pastoralists. That is, they had domesticated sheep and goat. They hunted animals. They went from coast to the inland. They were taking what they could, I think, from their interactions with uh, their settled neighbours. But they were never simply nomads. This is a misunderstanding of the economy. They chose what to use, and it fitted the environment which existed at this time throughout the Arabian Peninsula. What do we know about their lives? Well, at one site in the United Arab Emirates, the site of Jebel Buhais in Sharjah, we have an excellent insight into their lives. So here, this is a major cemetery. There's 500 burials in it, excavated in the 90s and the 2000s. And it dates to roughly the 5th millennium BC, from around 5,000 to 4,000 BC, maybe a little bit earlier. And the site itself was one of these campsites that people would camp at on the way to and from the coast every, on, a, on a seasonal route. And they chose to bury their dead there as well. And they chose the, to, de to bury their dead in a single place, time and time again, every year. This is a picture of the, the cemetery under excavation by a German archaeological mission in collaboration with the Sharjah Directorate of Archaeology. And the analysis of these skeletons gives us a great idea of what these people, how, how they lived. We know from the bones found in the nearby campsites, they had domesticated sheep, goat, and cattle. Hunted, but hunted only provide about 14% of the meat, so they were reliant on domesticated animals. We know from, um, from the sediments found in the burials that they're on a seasonal route from the coast. And we know very importantly that one of the reasons that they stopped at this little mountain, Jebel Buhais, was that there was a local spring that was active during the Neolithic. And it was active precisely because of this increased monsoon rainfall which characterized these millennia in Arabia. So they would stop at this spring, use it, get water, and then move on, and they would bury their dead before moving on, it seems, in the same place. We know a lot about, looking, about their diet, looking at the skeletons. They have heavy, heavy molar wear, indicated of repetitive chewing, so they had lots of meat. There's a, there's a near absence of caries or tooth decay, which is really interesting because that becomes a problem later on in the Bronze Age in this region. The people that study the skeletons note there's no cases of vitamin A, D, C, or calcium deficiency. They had a really good diet, a varied diet which exploited all of these particular regions within the United Arab Emirates. The coast, the desert, the inland Piedmont, and the mountains. They used each of those to ensure that they had a very healthy diet. Only nutritional stress that was observed in the skeletal evidence is from children, and this is not uncommon for prehistoric populations, particularly children uh, during the ages when they're weaned um, and they experience nutritional stress. According to the people who study the skeletons, they are taller than the modern inhabitants of the region. Um, and this might be a, a, a proxy for um, uh, their health and status during this period. They had a good long life by the age, by the comparison of um, Neolithic people. Average female life expectancy was about 33. Average male life expectancy was 36 to 40. Um, male death was mostly perimortem trauma. Um, interestingly, as opposed to what we see in the Fertile Crescent during this period, there is no difference in male or female treatment in the burials. Males are treated the same way as, as females. There is no grave good differentiation 
There are no people which get certain amounts of goods and others which don't get goods, except in the case of children. And that might be a cultural thing, not, not so much a hierarchy thing within the society. And I think that it is in this centuries of the 6th and 5th millennium that we can start to see this picture of a socially cohesive community emerging within this area. The outcome of these millennia of um, experimentation uh, and, and raging across this landscape, um, uh, we can characterize in the following fashion. Let's say by around 4000 BC, the monsoon retreats back to more or less its current position that is just affecting areas of southwestern Arabia and the areas of um, Dofa and Salala today. Um, but in these 4000 years, I think the community of people that lived here had developed a series of experiences and knowledge which made their society or put their society on a different trajectory than that which existed in the Fertile Crescent. They had a knowledge of landscape. They knew um, that, that there was a variegated landscape, each of which had different resources. This can be contrasted with the Fertile Crescent, where there is um, concentrated sedentary existence. If we go, if you cast your uh, mind back to that picture of Jurf al-Akmar, they're right on the Euphrates. And that's the area they're exploiting. There is very little variation in subsistence strategy. That's different in this region. They heavily exploited the coasts. And that makes it different from most of the area of the Fertile Crescent. And critically, they used subsurface water, springs, which were recharged because of the increased monsoon activity during these millennia. In the Fertile Crescent, the FC, as I've called it here, um, rain is... It, uh, access to water is fundamentally different. It's by rain-fed or riverine. And here's the important thing about that. Rain-fed or riverine water resources are very temporally variable. That is to say, if, there, if there's a decline in rainfall, the river stops. It affects rainfall agriculture, but it also affects the flow of the river. If you are exploiting subsurface water, it tends to last a lot longer. It provides a resource which can be returned to time and time again. And that's precisely what happens as the climate shifts to a, the more modern regime of precipitation that we see today. It also, I think, these millennia built a flexible and cohesive community. It was flexible in its subsistence strategy, and it was relatively cohesive that we, because we don't see evidence for the hierarchies which we see developing in the adjacent regions. In the next millennia, from 4000 to 3000 BC, there are big shifts occurring throughout the ancient Near East. We see the emergence of states, or the emergence of complexity, as it's referred to in the archaeological literature. And here, for example, I show just some... Uh, this is, this is uh, the Nama palette from Egypt, which is often used to illustrate the, um, the violent unification of Upper and Lower Egypt into a single state. And here is a reconstruction of the White Temple at Uruk, dating to about 3600 BC, which is often considered to be the first evidence for a state that we have in Mesopotamia. These are highly centralized, very bureaucratic, um, um, uh, top-down societies which emerge. And it is the general consensus of scholars that study these societies, that these societies emerge at this time in the fourth millennium BC precisely because of the climate changes which are affecting the region as a whole. Certain groups of people start to control staple products, such as wheat and barley within these irrigated agricultural landscapes, and they become powerful or they take power away from it. And there we see the emergence of single authorities within those regions. Highly bureaucratic authorities, as we can see here in this example of an archaic text from Uruk, most of which are simply records and receipts for agricultural and economic transactions controlled by the temple in southern Mesopotamia at this time. What happens in southeastern Arabia and the United Arab Emirates at this time? Well, the shift to a, a drier climate does affect the settlement, but the people that had lived here for thousands of years had developed knowledge of the different resources available. And so we see a shift during these millennia towards the coastal environments, which we can see some of the sites dating from 4000 to 3000 BC in this region here. These sites uh, are often seen as coastal refuge sites. They move to the coasts because there is fresh water available 
in this area, but they can also, particularly in this area, they can exploit these very um, proximal environmental zones, the mountains, the coasts, and the inland plains, the Batana. And that provides enough resources during these dry centuries for humans to um, um, subsist and perhaps thrive um, during this millennia when these other changes are occurring elsewhere in the region. The site which I think is really critical to understanding some of these in the United Arab Emirates is the site of Aqab, which as we can see here, the site is located in Umul Gawain in the United Arab Emirates. So you can see a view of the site here. It's excavated by Dr. Sophie Mary, who's here. <laughs> and um, I'm very kind of the illustrations I'm about to show she has um, supplied. And at this site, which had been, had been occupied earlier during the 5th millennium BC, around the 4th millennium BC, we see a sort of change in the way in which the environment is exploited. We see evidence for a mass um, kill of dugongs. Um, uh, mass kill occurring over um, several episodes. Dugongs, the manatee, the sea cow, was um, very common in coastal lagoon environments at this time. And the people, and we can see uh, an example of the, the bones of the dugongs here. And it's not just a pile of bones. Dr. Marie's excavations have shown that it's actually a carefully laid out platform of skulls of dugongs and ribs of dugongs arranged symmetrically so to create something of the animals which they've slaughtered. The amount of meat which is obtained from these is immense. And it's, it's one way to look at this is during this time of environmental stress, rather than the centralized, hyper-controlled uh, polities and societies which we see emerging in the Fertile Crescent, people in this environment started exploiting intensively resources which could be shared across the landscape. And this sharing of resources is pretty critical. It's a way of assuring what might be called ideological alignment during these millennia. People are remaining in communication with each other. They are avoiding, and I would say they are actively resisting, the possibility that one group starts to control the environment, or one group starts to control one particular resource, and therefore create um, uh, unequal access across the region as a whole. This way of operating, I think, continues throughout the fourth millennium BC, and we can start to see it then built into the societies during the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age in the United Arab Emirates lasts roughly from 3000 to 1200 BC. It is a period which is very well studied, and we have a huge amount of information on settlements and tombs of this period. This is just a... a, 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 a a map of um, some of those uh, important sites. It's during these periods that we see the emergence of agriculture. Um, beginning around 3000 BC, at the site of Hili 8 in Alain in Abu Dhabi, we see small-scale agriculture emerging. We can see here a picture of Hili 8 excavated by the French archaeological mission to Alain in the late 1970s and early 80s. It consists of a large mud brick tower and then a series of ancillary buildings, the earliest dating to around 3000 BC, but continuing for a, a, at least a thousand years um, after that. Here's a plan of the site. And what we can see in the middle of this building is a well right, located here. We can see it in this map, just there. And so th this well, um, was used to gather water for small-scale agriculture. The sort of things that were being cultivated are wheat and barley, um, and importantly, the date palm. By this stage, the date palm is certainly being cultivated in small-scale oases throughout the United Arab Emirates. But here's something to keep in mind. This is not like the agricultural revolution which took place elsewhere in the ancient Near East in earlier periods. It's not because the people who were practicing this small-scale agriculture in, this, in these oases were not solely ever reliant on agriculture. They grew other things besides cereal crops, such as the date palm, which could be used to make dibs and therefore kept for, for, uh, for the year. But they also continued to hunt. 
They continued to exploit the wild resources. They continued to exploit the coastal environments. They never turned their attention to just relying on one resource alone. And this is critical to understanding the environment of this region and critical to understanding the sorts of societies which existed here in prehistory. So it's not an agricultural revolution. And I would say at this point that when we look at the skeletal evidence, the bioarchaeological evidence we have for communities which undergo uh, a shift towards, the towards relying on agriculture alone throughout prehistory, we see this in the Near East as well, that generally, if we compare them to the people buried at Jebel Buhais, for example, their life expectancy is less and they suffer from more diseases. So people in this environment kept the, a broad spectrum of food resources being exploited during this period. They also didn't live in one zone. They moved towards the coast and lived in coastal environments. And here, for example, I would need to point out just a few miles away is the site of Ulmanar, located on Ulmanar Island. And in fact, it is this site which gives its name to the culture. We refer to this region between 2500 and 2000 BC as the Umanar culture. We can see on Umanar at this period there are warehouses, there are buildings, there are these distinctive tombs. You can see here, and I'm going to discuss them in a minute. People were fishing. These are um, weights for nets, they obviously fish hooks, and you can look at those fish hooks, they're made from bronze. People started to exploit the very rich copper resources which existed in the mountains and eventually started to export that material abroad. They also lived in the northern coastal environments, and here I um, point out my own excavations at the site of Tel Abrak, located in the Emirate of Sharjah. This is a view of our excavations taken a few weeks ago. Um, the excavations were originally led by Professor Dan Potts from 1989 to 1998, and I've um, excavated from 2007 onwards. At this site, we have fabulous evidence for a Bronze Age coastal um, um, town or settlement. You can see here, this, uh, this is a, a drone shot of our latest, a result of our latest excavations, this, this Bronze Age tower, which dates to about 2,500 BC, we can see it here. And just this year, we picked up the edge of it, um, just so it goes around in this direction. This was a thriving and important settlement in the coastal regions during this Bronze Age. And the question which you might have is, where did they get their water from? And here I'd like to introduce something else, which I think is critical to understanding human settlement. And that is in the coastal environments of the United Arab Emirates, people from the Neolithic period onwards became aware of the fact that fresh water is available. Now, if we think of the envir of coastal environments anywhere in the world, we are aware that nearly in all environments where there's any sediment underneath um, the coastal fringe, that denser seawater will penetrate under the ground. So you know that if you're at the beach and you dig a hole, obviously you're going to hit salt water. But in certain environments, you're going to hit fresh water first. The fresh water is going to be over the top of the denser salt water. This interface of fresh water, called the Geibel and Herzberg interface, um, is critically important to understand coastal environments in this region. And I would argue that its existence was understood already in the Neolithic period and it permitted fairly dense coastal settlement in the Bronze Age. So what happens is you can dig a well and here we have a well excavated. We excavated it at Telebrac um, last year. The well dates to about 2500 to 2000 BC, after which time it's filled in. And the well is just dug deep enough to access the fresh water. This is a really important technology. If you dig the well too deep and it goes into the salt water, it causes the salt water to, to create what's called a cone of intrusion. The salt water will come in, penetrate the fresh water, and make it undrinkable. So people understood this, and they dug wells accordingly. During this period, coastal environments are very critical for the ancient UAE, because it's in this period when the UAE is engaged in intensive economic interaction with uh, Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley, as we can see here in this map. The region 
At this time, in Mesopotamian sources, is known as Magan. Dilmun is Bahrain, is Mesopotamia. And the Indus Valley is Maluha. The area of the United Arab Emirates becomes a critical transshipment point in the movements of materials across this entire area from the northern parts of the Indian Ocean through and into the Arabian Gulf, as well as being a transshipment point, which we can see, for example, in the discovery of Indus Valley weights at Talabrak, Iranian pottery also at Talabrak and the tomb at Talabrak. Um, gold jewellery from the tomb at Talabrak, as well as material moving through this region. Copper being exported from this region is a critical resource. The area of the Fertile Crescent, in which there are large, now complex states operating, um, and particularly the areas of southern Mesopotamia, did not have access to hard, these immediate access to these hard resources. They had to trade with people in this region. To, to obtain these goods, such as the copper we see here. This increase in the economy and this flood of imported goods led, I suspect, to the possibility of their emerging or um, the possibility of increasing hierarchies throughout the entire region. In my most recent book, I argued that this had the potential to fray a society which had fundamentally well adapted to this environment over thousands of years. And hierarchies and um, the rise of authority and power, I would argue, are not natural processes. They're brought around by resource exploitation by a few. In this environment, we see something different emerge. We see, I would argue, an active... Um, active strategy to keep those processes at bay and keep the society relatively cohesive. We can see that in the tombs which dot the landscape during the Umanar period. These massive Umanar tombs, which you can see here, of course, in Hilly, in al in Abu Dhabi, and a number of the other examples. Here's an example from Tel Abrak. And these tombs are collective. As you can see from this picture from the tomb at Tel Abrak, people are put into the tomb and their bodies, through the processes of moving around, become intermingled with each other. No one is treated differently. People are buried with their grave goods, but they become commingled with their ancestors and with the community in which they had recently lived. These graves were also um, uh, very visible in the landscape. They are nearly always associated with settlements. And so as you're walking from the settlement in which you live, thinking perhaps that because you have access to certain materials that you are more important than other people. You might look across at the tomb and realise that you're going to come to the same end as everyone else. You'll be buried in the same way. There are no royal graves of Ur in this period. There's only these collective tombs. And I think they fundamentally communicated to the population something of an idealised, cohesive society which existed during this period of the Bronze Age. Now, around this time, in the rest of the Near East, there is something called the 4.2 KYA event, or um, around 21, 2200 BC, there is an aridification of the climate throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. It's seen as far away as Ireland, for example. Um, it's seen in Africa. And it is assumed by some scholars, or argued by some scholars, that this event led to the collapse of fairly major empires and states throughout the region. We see this, for example, in Egypt. And we see, for example, in the, um, as argued by some scholars, in the dissolution of the Akkadian Empire around 2100 BC. What happens in southeastern Arabia is we see the impact of this climate change, but Umanar settlement continues through it, and it continues to 2000 BC. After 2000 BC, there is a reorganization of settlement. There might be increased pastoralism. There might be people who are moving, it's not back towards what they had been in the Neolithic. It's just exploiting a resource or more intensively using a subsistence strategy which had always existed in this region. There seems to be no decrease, however, in copper mining. They're still exporting copper, this time via Bahrain, um, to Mesopotamia and elsewhere. This period we refer to as the Wadi Souk period and the late Bronze Age in the United Arab Emirates. And we see the continuation of settlement at sites like Telebrak, where we see these post-hole structures, 
which are probably Arish buildings. I think people are living at Telebrac at this time, but they're also remaining flexible. They're probably moving away from the site, maybe for several months a year, and coming back. The society doesn't collapse in the way in which the highly centralised structures of Mesopotamia and Egypt appear to collapse during this period. It continues throughout the second millennium, but it's fair to say that this period of bit between around 2000 BC and around 1000 BC is probably the period about which we know least at the moment in the United Arab Emirates. We have lots of tombs from this period, but not many settlements. And it's in fact precisely to explore this period that um, my excavations at Telebrac have focused on one particular part of the mound. Anyway, society continues. We probably see a mixed nomadic sedentary existence during these centuries. Towards the end of the second millennium BC, something else happens across the area of the Near East. Now recently, an archaeologist called by the name of Eric Klein has published a book called 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed. That's a pretty big call. Um, to suggest that civilization collapsed in one particular year. And this book, which is a New York Times bestseller, um, which is a, unusual for an archaeology book, um, uh, in fact, suggests that during this period, a, a mix of uh, movement of peoples driven by climate change in the eastern Mediterranean led to the world as we know it collapsing during these, um, during these centuries, and particularly around 1177 BC, apparently. Um, probably May 1177 BC. And um, in fact, it's important when we think about this, and the book is fine, and, um, uh, uh, but it's important to maintain some geographical perspective. These changes did affect the entire region, including the United Arab Emirates. There seems to be a decline in winter rainfall during the centuries as well. And it is the case that the major states which had existed in the Eastern Mediterranean along Syria and Lebanon and um, into Palestine and Egypt and Cyprus, they did suffer um, some sort of collapse. But let's put this in perspective in terms of what we think civilization is. The Arabian Peninsula, this area which we can see here, is larger than Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, Cyprus, Italy and Greece combined. So this part of the world, this Eastern Mediterranean, is a very small part of the world during these centuries. There are very large areas of human occupation which react differently to these climate changes. They are flexible in the way in which they absorb what we see in, happening in the environment in this period. And I think it's during this period, let's say the 11th and 12th centuries BC, that we can see some of these fundamental um, characteristics of the ancient UAE which make it different from these regions. So yes, there are paleoclimatic proxies which indicate progressing aridification in the UAE around 1100 BC. We see them in the Indian Ocean monsoon record, and we see that at lake sequences also in Russell Hamer. What's the reaction to this? Well, remember that people had subsisted on using subsurface water for thousands of years in this environment. Just before 1000 BC or around 1000 BC, People living at Mawela in the, um, my other excavation in Sharjah had dug a series of very shallow wells. And this was located more or less on the coast at the time. And these wells were perfect for gaining fresh water which lay above these saltwater environments. They understood how the water table worked. They understood aquifers and they understood recharge, I think, um, very well. And it's precisely because of that body of community knowledge which had built up, I would argue, over thousands of years and was passed on from society to society, that this region reacts differently to climate change than apparently civilization of Eastern Mediterranean in 1177 BC. As rainfall declined, spring activity would have declined and the water table would have certainly been affected in the United Arab Emirates. Springs had been used since the Neolithic period, well-driven, um, using wells and runoff irrigation had occurred throughout the region from 2,500 BC. This had generated a knowledge of aquifers, recharge. The declining precipitation certainly would have affected these available sources of fresh water. 
So how do you cope with that, given the body of knowledge which you and your ancestors have generated and, and kept over thousands of years? Well, if you think about a well or spring, a simple source of water, if it starts to dry up, there are several things you can do. You can dig deeper, and that's going to work for a little while. But eventually, you're going to tap out the immediate saturated sediment from which the well is occurring. The other way to deal with it is to keep digging, but don't dig vertically. Dig horizontally instead. So dig these tunnels which move across the landscape, these tunnels which are effectively, in a way, horizontal wells, digging across water lane sediment, which you can see here, and then transporting the water out to lower-lying um, areas. This is the Falage system or the Kanat system, one of the most common techniques of irrigation in the United Arab Emirates until the modern day. It's long been argued to be an invention of imperial centers, going back to Polybius Book 10, when he argues that the Achaemenids introduced, the Persian Empire introduced the Kanat or the, or the Falaj system to the areas of the Near East. In fact, now it appears from our evidence that the earliest evidence we have so far for this technology is in the United Arab Emirates and the Sultanate of Oman, dating to exactly this period of climate challenge. And I think we can see this technology in exactly that way. It's a response to a climatic problem built upon centuries of community knowledge about where water was available and how to access water. The societies which build the Kanat systems are not states. They are small-scale communities which have the knowledge and have the technology to build these incredible systems of irrigation. The tunnels can go for kilometers under the ground. And several of these have been discovered throughout the UAE, dating to around 1000 BC. As an example of one of them, you can see here these holes. This is the one from Al Ain, excavated um, many years ago by Dr. Walid Yassin al Takriti. And um, I think one of the clearest uh, pictures of the impact of this technology is this image, which is a, um, the outcome of a Falaj system in Al Faqaiba, in the Al Madan plain in uh, Sharjah. And here we have, you can see these, if I just go back, the Kanat system or the Falaj system has these access holes. And here we can see the access holes. You can see now it's a very arid landscape. And the, the the Falaj system is just coming out to the surface here. The water is being brought, and then it's being channeled out. And we can well imagine these larger holes contain date palms. And in between the date palms, cereal crops and other crops would have been grown. This fundamentally alters human settlement in this region. It results in an intensification of settlement across the United Arab Emirates um, between uh, 1,100, 1,000, and 600. BC. That sets in play one of the main characteristics of traditional life in the UAE, the Falaj system. The ability to, to have long-term sustained agriculture in inland oases areas. The last point, the last um, characteristic that I'd like to talk about today is something which we've just been working on recently. And that is if we think about traditional life in the UAE, which is always flexible and always moving and adapting to the environment as it changes. The other prime component of it is, of course, the use of the domesticated dromedary camel. And what people have not researched or, or considered well enough is that during the period of the Bronze Age and well into the Neolithic, people within this region had been exploiting the camel intensively. So when we think about when, when Near Eastern archaeology, which focuses on the Fertile Crescent, focuses on the issue of camel domestication, they tend to see it as a way in which the nomads of Arabia, to go back to Kathleen Kenyon's quote, the nomads of Arabia domesticated the camel so that they could trade their goods to the Fertile Crescent. This is so fundamentally um, problematic, I think. If you're looking at a camel, a dromedary camel, for the first time, there's nothing intuitive about thinking I could use that to move my goods from point A to point B. And, and in fact, trade like that only occurs when there is an existing surplus 
and people were thinking about generating a surplus with the idea of trade, the idea that people had been building up surpluses of goods which were just left rotting and they were looking at camels and they were thinking, oh, should do that. It doesn't ring true to me for some reason. And in the United Arab Emirates, we can see something interesting from this perspective. Um, people since the Neolithic period had hunted the camel and eaten it. The camel was always an important part of the diet. Um, at Banuna, we find in Abu Dhabi, we find evidence for, for camels which are dead of this period, whether or not they are slaughtered for hunting, I, we're, we're still not sure. But at the site of Al Safu in Dubai, we see a mass kill site dating to the third and second millennium BC. 17,812 camel bones dated from the beginning of the second millennium up to around 1200 BC. Basically what happened is camels came back to the same area, coastal environment, um, every uh, winter and people would wait there and kill them and eat them. <clears throat> and next time the camels would come back again. <laughs> obviously not perturbed by the carcasses they saw around. And, um, and this went over for centuries, this mass killing. So people got to know the camel very well. They got to know its habits. They got to know probably its breeding patterns. They got to know the animal through hunting it for thousands of years. And we can see what happens with this hunting at the site of Telebrac, to come back to this. At the site of Telebrac, from around 2000 BC, we see the slow decline of the amount of wild camels in the archaeozoological record. They are perhaps being hunted out or their wild populations are declining through a mixture of being hunted out and through climate change towards the end of the second millennium BC. Around 1000 BC, we see an increase in the number at Telebrac. When they um, appear after 1000 BC, they are smaller. And this smaller size of camels is consistent with the outcome of domestication. Smaller camels are, well, all mammals that have been domesticated, once they're domesticated, are smaller than their wild progenitors. And we can, we, this has been used to suggest that it's around 1000 BC that we see the initial evidence for the appearance of domesticated dromedary. And the sites in the United Arab Emirates, both Telebrac and another site, which I'll discuss briefly, have provided the best evidence for the initial appearance of domesticated dromedary in the Arabian Peninsula and, by extension, elsewhere in the Near East. The other site that I excavate, the site of Mawela, which we can see here, after the appearance of domesticated dromedary, this is a drone shot of a very large, walled, Iron Age II settlement dating to about 3,000 years ago. You can see a clearer plan of it here as it existed by around 800 BC. These settlements thrive as a result of the appearance of the domesticated dromedary. We see large amounts of um, um, bones being used in this, uh, found at this site, and it seems we're just putting the uh, final touches to a publication looking at the strontium ratios or the chemistry of the teeth, that these camels were kept close to the site. One or two might have been used for long distance trade, but they were probably kept close to the site and used for pastoralism, maybe I think largely driven perhaps by their milk that they supplied to the local population. They were however used for transport eventually can see this, for example, in this figurine which we discovered at Moeda, which clearly shows some sort of saddle or a load on top of the figurine. I would argue that it's a saddle and therefore it's domesticated. Um, if it's a load, it's still domesticated because you would just be foolish to put a load of goods onto a wild camel because um, you won't see it again. And we can see the same thing at Telebrac, in fact. We see the same sorts of figurines appearing after 1000 BC. This process um, of domestication, we're not sure where it happened, but we can see the outcomes most clearly in the archaeological record of the United Arab Emirates. Currently, um, the research is pointing towards the conclusion that this area, the United Arab Emirates and the Sultanate of Oman, 
is a candidate for the initial domestication of the dromedary in the ancient Near East. I'm very cautious about saying that, but I think the evidence is moving in that direction, but I certainly wouldn't make that claim just yet. But the important thing is that this fundamental transformation, this adaptation to the desert environment was built upon a lengthy exploitation of a resource, knowledge of a resource, and then was a reaction to dwindling numbers of these wild camels throughout this region. Obviously, as we know, the camel then becomes critical to the economy and the environment within populations living. The camel is used for living in the Arabian Peninsula. The camel is used for short trade, for between settlements, and then slowly, as we see, it's, it's used for creating connections within, between settlements of the Arabian Peninsula as a whole. This changes the polarity of the ancient Near East. Arabia emerges as a very powerful economic force in the late centuries BC and early centuries AD. It had been an economic force already in terms of the supply of raw materials. But during the Bronze Age, when copper was supplied to Mesopotamia and elsewhere, it was boats, boats which were controlled by the state in Mesopotamia to some extent, material which was being brought into ports and could be taxed or controlled. That was the, me that was the mechanism by which trade occurred. During the late first millennium BC and then into the first millennium AD, the situation changes. Not only are the materials of Arabia being distributed across the entire ancient Near East, but the means of transport are controlled by the people living within the Arabian Peninsula itself. And this provides a mechanism that we see then for the emergence of large-scale desert places such as Palmyra. Palmyra, <coughs> Petra, uh, in the introduction we heard of Malaya, important areas within the United Arab Emirates, and southwestern Arabia. And I can see that I, could, I would argue that maybe it is in this period, maybe in the early centuries BC and then early centuries um, AD, we see a reorganization of the polarity of trade and interaction between the Fertile Crescent. And that reorganization is a result of millennia of human occupation, millennia of occupation which existed, exploited environmental zones, adapted to climate change, and then Eight and a half thousand years after domesticated sheep and goat from the Fertile Crescent came into the Arabian Peninsula, the situation has changed and remains changed forever. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk, really stimulating. Um, my question has to do, as a historian, with writing and... Mm -hmm also perhaps religion. Right. Um, could you tell us about any of that happening? <laughs> well, as a professor, I think that writing is overrated. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so uh, we do see evidence for the emergence of um, a script um, in southwestern Arabia um, around already by 1200 BC. And there is uh, examples of that script called Monument or Ancient South Arabian, Monumental Sabian, being used in the United Arab Emirates by about 800 BC. Right, so, and then by 300 BC in the United Arab Emirates, we see, I would not say the large scale use of script and writing, but um, it's fairly common. And that the script is, uh, the script itself is ancient South Arabian, and the languages which are written, maybe Sabine or Hasidic, it changes. And um, we also see within those centuries, from the third century BC onwards, the use of Aramaic. Um, not uncommonly, in the United Arab Emirates. The um, religion, so we do see evidence for religion. I didn't have a chance to speak about that, but in the Iron Age, we start to see the emergence of ritual centers um, uh, throughout, this, uh, throughout the UAE and Oman. And these ritual centers seem to be associated in some way with uh, copper and metal production. And we see evidence for a, f a ritual focus on snakes. Um, so a few of these sites have revealed dozens of bronze snakes which have been deposited in some sort of ritual context. The meaning of that, 
I, we don't know. That's why we use the term ritual. Um, but um, I think that's a pretty important part of the story. And I think it's interesting to consider these sites as sites in which people would travel through these regions and then visit these maybe ritual pilgrimage sites. Um, as, and that creates a, a social mechanism which links communities together. Thank you. So, so you mentioned about the kind of egalitarianism you saw within the uh, various different communities. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, um, does that... I, didn't, I, it's a bit, I never used the word egalitarian. Okay, sorry, that's something sorry, different, that's yeah. yeah. <laughs> Acephalus, yeah. yeah. Uh, and no real great difference in status and hierarchy. There, there, is, there, is hi there is hierarchy, but it's not materialist hierarchy in the way it is in the adjoining states. Yep. Um, so I was wondering, does that point to any, any kind of division of labor within those communities and societies, or is everybody doing everything? No, I think there is a division of labor, and I think um, we can assume there's some division of labor in these societies. Um, so in these sorts of societies which are marked by social cohesion, asabia, as Ibn Khaldun refers to it, um, um, it doesn't mean that everyone is equal uh, in, in the way in which we would use that term. It means that structures within those societies are negotiated. Um, there's not absolute authority or rule um, in the way there was, for example, in ancient Egypt. Um, but there, so there would have been division of labor. There would have been, certain people would have been making pots all year round. Certain people would have been working in the fields. Certain people would have been hunt, specialized in hunting. Certain people would have specialized in fishing. We do see those horizontal, I think, divisions within those societies, certainly. Um, throughout the history of the region. Hello. So um, how exactly would they govern themselves? If, um, would there just be a group of people taking from the different divisions of laborers and they discuss among themselves, or was it something else? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, um, I think people can organize themselves quite effectively. Um, now, I don't think... Um, when I'm talking about the absence of um, power structures, that doesn't mean that there are not people who are respected and who uh, people would go to for advice. And, and um, there would be people who are effectively in charge, but they're in charge not because they control something. They're in charge because they're respected within the society, because they've done certain things, they've illustrated wisdom, maybe they're good at hunting. These sorts of non-material reasons are the ways in which I think these societies could be um, structured. So I do think in a case like Muela, um, I don't like to use the term sheikh in this regard because I think it, we don't want to collapse everything into the past and present, but I could easily imagine each of these Iron Age settlements had someone like that who was respected and someone who would go off and negotiate. Um, but that person, I suspect, and we see this in these, these buildings, which we see, was also heavily engaged in consultation uh, as a way of um, making sure the society still functioned and um, governed. And that, I offer that as a contrast to, let's say, New Kingdom Egypt. Um, I, I don't think Tutankhamun was into consultation as far as I can judge um, from the archaeological, and certainly not Ramesses III either, from what we know. Um, and so I think there, there are structures, but they're, they're, they're operating in a, on a different basis. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that copper was present for a very long time. So what did you notice about the introduction of money, and what's the story that you uh, have about that? Yeah, so... Um, Coinage appears in the United Arab Emirates around 250 BC, um, and we have evidence, um, as Dr. Kidd introduced, as a, uh, noted, there is a, a very uh, powerful kingdom in the interior parts of the UAE centered around the modern village of Malaya, and there around 250 BC we have evidence for um, coinage. So we actually see the coins themselves, but we also have um, a coin mold which is used to make the coins. So that appears around 250 BC. Thousands of years after the massive export of copper. But um, for that to work, for the massive export of copper to work, 
Um, and from Mesopotamian documents, we know that there was a weight system um, which operated through Mesopotamia onto Bahrain, and we have evidence, I think, for its um, applicability in the United Arab Emirates. So that weight system is enough because if you have a weight system and you use silver as a, as a value attached to the weight system, that permits exchange. And that seems to be what's happening in um, the region as a whole from around 3000 BC onwards. We have um, good evidence for a weight system which the base unit is like Eight grams, I think. So, and it, it seems to, and we have evidence of the weights being found. So, I think that is the facilitator. When coinage appears, I don't think that system of weights. If you were to go back um, uh, to the, uh, to a souk in in Abu Dhabi or Dubai in Sharjah in the nineteenth century, weights against silver and other materials would have been used as well as coinage. So, I think coinage slowly becomes more common. But the initial coins that we have from this region in the third century. BC. I don't think they are used in the same way that we use coins today. Um, um, they're much rarer, uh, and they might have been used as a standard against something else. Any evidence of shipbuilding in any of the sites that you've excavated? Yes, there was so much to discuss that I left so much out. Um, so um, I actually had a slide of this, but I took it out this afternoon. Um, so, at Telebrac recently, and in the earlier excavations, um, at the site of Umanar as well, um, from 2,500 BC, and perhaps most obviously from a site called Ras al II in, in Ras al Had in the Sultanate of Oman, um, we have um, fairly large amounts of bitumen. And um, this bitumen would be used, um, amongst other things, to cork the exterior of the boat. And we can see from the example from the site in Oman, we can see the plank and rope impressions on the bitumen, which then permits us to have some idea of the sort of sea craft which were being used. And indeed, a um, archaeologist rebuilt one of these boats based upon examining bitumen, examining um, the sort of rope systems. He was a nautical engineer as well. So he rebuilt one of these Bronze Age boats. It sank just off the coast. Sorry, it's not funny. <laughs> and, um, but he, he, didn't, he, he didn't get it right. I mean, yeah, he got it right, but obviously things didn't work out. I mean, having said that, of course, lots of boats sink, right? Um, we only know about the boats that made it to the port. <laughs> um, and so, um, yeah, there was a very active um, uh, boat building technology. And we know from Mesopotamian sources, we can sort of work out the size of some of them. So, for example, in one record, um, we have evidence for about a, a shipment of 17 tons of copper. Um, and um, this wouldn't have been in one boat. It might have been in more than one boat, one suspects. But there were fairly large seagoing craft um, moving large amounts of material from the Indus here and in into Mesopotamia. There are one or two models of boats as well from the Neolithic period in Kuwait um, um, as well. Okay, I'm sure there are plenty more questions, but I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. So I'd like you to um, join me in thanking once again Peter for a really fantastic talk. Um, Thank you very much.